Good morning. You're with us here on a fresh new edition of Bazaar Morning Call. I am Prashant. With me, my colleagues, Sonia and Nigel. Guys, hi. Uh, good morning. Good I mean, morning. Uh, you know, it's perhaps going to be a little bit more of a wait because the market is indicating a slight downtick. Uh, there is the big uh, sort of U.S. print, inflation print, which, is, uh, which comes out later tonight. And uh, I think global markets are keenly awaiting. That is the single most important data point today. U.S. market snapped a three-day rally. And we ended between two and two and a half odd percent on the S and P and the Nasdaq. It's a complete train wreck on uh, cryptos. I mean, Bitcoin has lost almost forty percent uh, in value in two sessions. It's about the sixteen thousand dollar mark, and it's the largest two-day fall since two thousand and twenty. Are there any spillovers to the rest of the uh, sort of uh, asset classes? Perhaps no. And SGX Nifty is indicating a 90-point downtick after the pullback that we saw yesterday, which brings us, if we get this kind of open, you're basically looking at about 18,100 uh, at start. Guys, good morning. Hi, morning, Prashant. Morning, Nigel. Morning. You said the single biggest data point was what? The CPI data. I think you're looking at Bitcoin, is it? No, or no? I'm, I'm the single <laughs> biggest thing today is the India-England match. Ah, I'm yeah. almost 1.30 <laughs> in the afternoon. I don't know about you guys, but I'm not going to be tracking the markets for sure. It's a big one, right? Absolutely. And if India goes through, then you have that Big Bang Sunday. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So, <laughs> so I, 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 I recant my... <laughs> <laughs> volumes are going to thin out maybe <laughs> post 1.30, right? I mean, no, but uh, jokes apart, there is a global sell-off and you have to deal with it. Of course, uh, the bulls were on top, but today is going to be a different day. There's a gap down opening that we're looking at. It's in fact getting worse uh, by the minute. So uh, the SGX Nifty is at the lowest point of trade. Uh, this crypto sell-off that Prashant was referring to is also going to weigh on the market for sure because of all that's transpired. And it's really spectacular. I mean, what's happening in the crypto market, right? Binance has now backed out of plans to acquire the rival FTX after having put in the word and almost the money for the last many months, finally, that's, FTX is pretty much on the verge of a collapse. And we've seen it in Bitcoin as well. $16,100, which is, I think, the lowest that we've seen since November of 2020. Some ripple effect is what we're seeing in global markets too. Um, the midterm elections in the US were a bit indecisive. So there's some lack of clarity there of a control of the Congress in the US. So that's having a bit of a, a, you know, a rub off impact on global markets. But yes, as we were discussing, all eyes will be on the CPI data. The headline CPI is expected to grow about 7.9%. In that context, for our own markets, um, the going has been really good. But today, after the gap down opening, will there be a buy-in? You never know. Uh, time will tell. But that's been the trend so far, a buy on dips market. The FII buying has cooled off a little bit. It's less than about 400 odd crores, so not as high as what we saw in the last many days. The I selling is there. So let's see, today is a tricky day for the bulls, but will they use it as an opportunity uh, to lap up their stocks? Because, you know, that's been the trend for the last many that years. That has been, Sonia. But I think because of the U.S. inflation number, and it's proved to be so pivotal in the past as well, maybe it's better to just wait, wait. look at the data, and then decide uh, what to do. So, uh, as I said, you know, the midterms did away, but the CPI number, and if it's a beat, uh, you know, it uh, perhaps puts pressure high, uh, upward pressure on the dollar if it's a miss. And it has to be a meaningful beat or a meaningful miss uh, for any sort of meaningful price action, subsequent price action. So I think, uh, you know, makes sense to kind of wait this one out and see which way things go because it will drive Fed pricing, dollar, etc. By the way, I was pointing out how the dollar has been weak for three days. It reversed yesterday. The DXY is now closer to 110.5 as compared to you know, coming to that 20-week moving average, et cetera, which is 109 point something. All right. Now, the S&P ended a three-day rally, and uh, we were down about, what, 2%, 2.1%, the Nasdaq a little bit more. Uh, it's a combination of inconclusive midterms. Uh, earnings are coming in poor. I mean, we've seen, for example, the single largest tech layoff in history, the meta layoff that, we've, uh, that we kind of uh, talked about. Uh, all of that will weigh. And, of course, there is the crypto turmoil. Uh, it's unclear uh, how much of this crypto turmoil will weigh on uh, in a direct way or even in an indirect way uh, on other asset classes like equities, etc. But, you know, people like uh, Mark Mobius, who've come on the program for the, uh, all through this year without a prompt of uh, sort of uh, put forward the point that it's an important uh, asset class in the U.S. now 
and uh, what happens there has implications for what people will do with their money in other parts of uh, sort of equity stocks, treasuries, etc. So Bitcoin and, and Ethereum lost 14 and 16 percent respectively. On the bit on Bitcoin, it's this uh, it's uh, the biggest two day loss since 2020. I would say no direct spilloff. It doesn't add to sentiment in a, in a positive way. Perhaps does something on the negative side. Oil is thankfully back to about $92 a barrel. Brent oil prices. Inventory data came out, and I think that uh, uh, sort of uh, pushed things. Nifty is back in the congestion zone. You know, I won't be very specific with levels on the Nifty, but the fact is we are again uh, around the 18,100 kind of level, which the index has been around for the last, what, almost six trading sessions now. So you need a conclusive push. And this is a point I was making on Monday as well. That push seemed like it is. it came, but it fizzled out yesterday. So I think uh, we'll see. You need to get past 18,200, 18,300 in a in a meaningful way. On the bank nifty, we did hit, hit a high, took out the earlier September levels of 41,840, uh, but we closed below it. So that kind of be, uh, becomes the immediate kind of level to watch. Uh, and I think uh, it would add to confidence if that were to be taken out in a significant way. On the way down, 41,434 is a support level on the bank nifty that you need to watch out for. So, uh, you know, as I said, as I began by saying, maybe today with an inflation uh, number looming in front of us, uh, but that's only tonight in the U.S. Perhaps a wait-and-watch kind of strategy makes more sense. Nadir, what are you watching? Well, uh, you know, morning, guys. If we didn't have enough red on the screen, Sonia decided to pile in, right, on yeah. that one. <laughs> red, uh, Sonia, today. But uh, it's going to be blue, right, Sonia? Second half of trade today. Bleed blue, right? <laughs> Weekly expiry can wait. <laughs> India all the way. All right. Okay. Getting... But England's, uh, I mean, England's also got a very strong chance. Right? They're, they're playing really well. We're coming out on Just top. Just stating right? the facts. We're coming out on top today. <laughs> no two ways about that. And we've got a date on Sunday. And on Monday morning, we'll celebrate out here. <laughs> Let's hope. Okay. Absolutely. Let's get back to the markets. That You know, in terms of flows first, just want to highlight a couple of factors. The FI is the country to remain buyers. So yesterday, they bought 400 crores. But that's the lowest you've seen in the nine sessions. Now, when I look at the institutional flows, I look at the FI and the DI number together. And yesterday, they were net sellers. If you're looking at the previous 10 sessions, well, they were buying closer around 1,000 crores odd. Now, that was the reason that, in fact, we did see some selling yesterday. Because otherwise, the FI flows have been so strong, it's been offsetting the DI outflows. But yesterday, that wasn't the case. So we'll have to keep an eye out on this, particularly since we have some supply that's coming into the market. You got that Axis Bank deal. You have some of these new age IPOs like uh, Nika where the lock-in expires. So we'll keep an eye out uh, on that. The FIs in the FNO market, they continue to remain net long on index futures. However, on the option side yesterday, they wrote calls very aggressively. So they wrote closer on 11 calls yesterday for every one, one put. So, you know, that's telling you that, in fact, you know, at higher levels, we'll actually see some bit of supply that could come in. On the option side, what were they writing? The 18,300, 18,200 calls, both of them massive openers built up, closer on 95 lakh shares added between then, telling you that... There is going to be supply. The 18,350 will require a bigger trigger to get past that. However, on the downside, the 18,000 put, that has the highest open interest, and that's the line on the sand. Near-term support will come in at around the 17,950-odd mark. Remember, last week itself, we visited those levels, and then we saw a bit of a bounce. So for me, that's the first level you need to look at in terms of support. Resistance, as I said earlier, 18,300, 18,350. The buy on dips thesis is going to be tested today. Yesterday, it didn't work out. Today, it's going to be tested because we're likely to start off with a cut of closer under 100, 110 points odd, which will not be such a bad thing. If the first star lows are defended, given that it's expiry and you have the highest open risk at 18,000 put, risk reward could favor the bulls. So we'll keep an eye on that. SJX Nifty has moved to the low point of the day as we speak. What else on it? Absolutely. So 100 points lower, right? I just want to take uh, what Prashant was saying forward about how meta has had the largest layoff in the his, in, in the US history, you know, 11,000 people laid off. And that impact is felt on corporate earnings as well. I mean, just look at Tata Motors, right? It's a player that has a huge global focus. And they're saying, they're not mincing words. They're saying that the global challenges continue. They've, in fact, lowered their EBIT guidance as well for FY23 earlier. They said they'll do 5% EBIT for GLR. Now they're saying at best it'll be positive. So these global-focused companies, you just want to sort of keep them on your radar. Be a bit cautious over there. Uh, there are a lot of earnings to watch out for today. There's Aisha Motors, Ashok Leland, Bata coming out with numbers. So a lot of non-index large caps as well that we'll be tracking closely. And of course, the Axis Bank deal. Government will be exiting Axis Bank with 1.5% stake sale. And that will uh, garner about over 4,000 crores. There's the Nike lock-in that expires. So lots to talk about. 
But without wasting any time, we kickstart the day with a red hue on the screen. And first up, we have a comment coming in from Venugopal Gare of Bernstein, who says that India needs to deliver for the greater good of emerging markets. And this is the message from emerging market investors struggling with uncertainty in China. He says while FY flows turn positive from July, the level of flows, however, does not suggest any active shift yet as valuations are rich and investors await an earnings lift in a broadly slowing economy. He says they stick with their sector allocations which favour financials and remain underweight on consumption. Well, let's get you some money market views as well. Uh, Parul Mittal Sinha, Standard Chartered says the dollar INR has slipped below 82 a dollar handle last week and broad dollar weakness. She expects the dollar INR to trade in the 81 to 82 uh, per dollar range this week with, do with dollar and oil prices staying key driver, she says. Likely widening in trade deficit and a real effective exchange rate overvaluation is likely to continue to pressure Forex in the medium term. Okay, and on the bonds, she says that domestic rates eased last week, mapping global trends post the week non-farm payroll print. She expects a 10-year benchmark bond yield to trade in the 73 to 7.5% range with a close eye on US and India CPI prints. She also expects easing in the US CPI to 8% from 8.3% earlier, while India CPI probably will cool to 6.6% versus 7.4% earlier. Well, there's a lot of stock-specific action to track for you today, and we'll get to that in just a bit in our special Top 10 segment. We're looking at Lupin, Petronet LNG, Narayana Health. Those are stocks that are uh, in focus on the back of positive news flow, while we have Tata Motors, Pirulite, Pyramid Enterprises, Deepak Nitride, Star Health, Axis Bank, as well as Nika, they are stocks that will be reacting to some negative news flow. All right, so that's a list of stocks to watch. Uh, Suresh Tantia is a senior investment strategist at Credit Suisse, and he's joining us now to take some questions. Suresh, good to have you with us here. Thank you very much. Uh, so we get one more monthly inflation print out of the U.S. How pivotal will that be in deciding Fed pricing and trajectory for risk assets from here? I think the, today's inflation number will be very important because in the past two months, markets have been disappointed. Um, markets were looking for a peak in inflation, but that didn't materialize. Going forward, I think the trend is clear. Numbers will be lower, but the focus will be more on the components of inflation. What we're going to see is that some of the components such as secondhand car prices or the commodity prices inflation could come down. But at the same time, uh, rentals and um, the uh, labor market tightness is going to keep the inflation sticky. So I don't think today's inflation number is going to change Fed's trajectory in terms of the December rate hike. It's more or less given that um, it, they are going to hike by 50 basis point and end the um, U.S. Uh, terminal rate sometime in the first half of next year, around 5%. Mm. Uh, so, Suresh, hi, good morning and thanks for speaking to CNBC TV 18. Uh, your thoughts on how to approach a market like India? It's roaring out here. Uh, the money is coming in thick and fast. We are virtually at all-time highs. When you get dips like this, some caution in global markets, is it a good time uh, to buy in? Uh, India has been absolutely amazing uh, given the strong performance this year, despite 20% uh, plus sell-off that we have seen in emerging market year to date. Um, I think it's driven by the fundamental strength of Indian economy, um, more domestic driven economy and the recovery from the COVID. Um, but at this kind of valuation, I think the room for further outperformance is very limited. If you look across uh, the uh, region, the valuations are very attractive in markets like Korea, Taiwan, uh, China, even some of the South Asian markets are looking more attractive. So from an absolute perspective, yes, I think India can do well given the strong recovery. But from a relative perspective, I see better value in the rest of the Asian markets. Mm. So uh, Suresh, uh, just to uh, confirm that, uh, you believe that we are, we are uh, uh, you know, at the upper end of our range and taking some money off the table for the Indian markets will be prudent? Um, it's quite likely that you see profit booking taking place at these kind of levels, especially with the uh, Nifty at uh, above 18,000 level and price to earning ratio above 18. Uh, but if you see 5 to 10 percent kind of correction, I think you will see a dip, uh, buy on dip mentality taking place given the strong fundamentals. So I won't be surprised to see some profit booking, but again, buy on dip uh, on 5 to 10 percent correction. Okay. All right. We will leave it at that. Suresh, thanks a lot for joining in and giving us a quick call. So there could be profit taking, but buy on dips if there's a 5 to 10% correction.
is something that's uh, prudent to do especially for the Indian markets. Let's slip into a quick break. So many stocks to talk about. It's the fag end of the earnings season. Our list of top 10 stocks lined up next. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're tuned in to Bazaar Morning Call. You're on CNBC TV 18. Well, today we are bracing for a bit of a gloomy start to trade, but that's what's happening with the rest of the Asian markets as well. The SGX NFT is suggesting a pullback of close around 90 to around 100 points odd. But there are going to be plenty of stocks that will be reacting to news flow. Well, and our research team is standing by to run you through the entire list. But Sonia, you go first. Tata Motors, a disappointing set of numbers, right? It was. You know, uh, on a year-on-year -year basis, the numbers will look good because it was a very low base of last year. And last year, there was a semiconductor issue. But if you compare it to most estimates, these are disappointing numbers. A big loss is what uh, Tata Motors has posted, 950 crores. The EBITDA is much lower than what the street was estimating. JLR, although uh, the margins were not bad, it was a fall that we saw quarter on quarter of 230 basis points. And the company reported a negative free cash flow of 15 million pounds because of adverse working capital movement. Uh, the India business EBITDA was up 52 percent at 680 crores but over there as well it's lower than what the street was penciling in because of higher raw material and a one-time cost. The worry for me is that the debt for Tata Motors is rising. So as of Q2, they have almost 60,000 crores of debt compared to 48,700 uh, at the end of FY22. So that's a problem. The other worry is that JLR has lowered their guidance. As I mentioned earlier, earlier they had a 5 percent EBIT margin guidance for the full year. Now they are saying it will be positive. So in that sense, they have a little bit of uh, you know lack of clarity on how the global uh, situation will pan out. Also, they are saying that they'll have free cash flow break even in FY23. But earlier, the guidance was a, a one billion pound free cash flow by the end of FY23. So they are not committing to any numbers, which is which means that they have sort of lowered their guidance. And hence, I'm going with red for this stock. Oh yeah, not a uh, not this kind of numbers or kind of uh, interpretation that you want from a, a performer like this one. 4.33 on Tata Motors. We'll see how the stock opens up. Now, PD Light is the other one which we'll focus on. Mangalam is here with more on the numbers. Mangalam, hi. Hi. Uh, so, you know, as far as Pidlai's numbers are concerned, we keep talking about uh, the moat that Fevicol has, but looks like maybe the input costs also got some Fevicol stuck in them, and that's why they are at the highest levels that we've seen. And these numbers are much below what the street was anticipating. In fact, the revenue was a slight miss, but if you just take a look at the EBITDA, the margins have come in at 16.6%, much below the company's own band of 20 to 24 odd percent, but importantly, below street expectations of 17.5% as well. And as a result of which, the net profits have been lower than anticipation. Importantly, the volumes the consumer business has grown by just about 1.2 percent overall business is also seen just about marginal volume growth my sense is it is sub one percent out there and the management commentary as well says that you know raw material prices were at all-time highs but at the same time you know it was the forex volatility as well as uh, high cost inventory that they were sitting on which impacted their performance as far as demand is concerned urban's doing well rural not so much and uh, they hope that there could be some easing now that prices have come off highs but currently see the stock opening in the red today. Okay, all right. Manglam, thanks for that. Uh, well, let's uh, hop across to Ekta. She's here to tell us about Lupin. Ekta, numbers look better than expected? Well, largely in line, you'd have to say, because we were expecting a flattish growth. They've reported a flat performance in terms of revenue on a year-on-year -year basis. But what stands out is that the margins had improved all the way to around 10.9%. Street was in anticipating 10.7%. So yes, the recovery has come through. And this is versus 6% last quarter. So the street is going to take that margin recovery with both hands. Profit was lower than estimates, but really the street is going to be squarely uh, placed in terms of margins, what the exit run rate could be, as well as the U.S. business going forward, because the U.S. business did better than expectations. $159 million versus estimates of $155 million and versus estimates of 120 uh, versus $121 million in the previous quarter. So that's definitely a big thumbs up for Lupin. Okay, thanks a lot for that. Well, uh, let's go across to Sonal now. Uh, she's tracking... Uh... Deepak Knight, right? Sonal, over to you. 
Uh, good morning. Well, it was another weak set coming in from Deepak Nitrite. Weak numbers led by the phenolics division. If you look at the revenues, they declined 17% on a YY basis. EBITDA was down 30%, leading to a margin decline of almost 900 basis points at 13.8%. Profits also for the company declined by 31%. Looking at their segmental division, advanced intermediates, they did well. So revenues and EBIT both increased on a YY basis. But if we look at the phenolics division, there was a decline on a YY and on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis. Basis. EBIT halved on a YY basis, declined 45% on a sequential basis. Expect the stock to be in the red today. All right. Uh, so, so thanks very much uh, for that. Pyramal Enterprises is uh, the next one. We'll uh, uh, sort of turn our eyes to Abhishek is standing wide with more. Abhishek, hi, morning. Morning, Prashant. So it's a massive uh, net loss that Pyramal Enterprise on their financial business have reported. Uh, the loss is about 1,537 crores as stress, uh, stress assets have weighed on the performance. So they have made a provision of about 3,311 crores, which compares to 122 crore in the previous quarter. Uh, this is on account of close to 5,900 crore off book, uh, which has moved from stage one to stage two. That is the overdues are uh, were under uh, 30 days uh, last time around, but it's now uh, overdue uh, above uh, 60 days. So that movement has caused this massive provision. They are large and lumpy accounts is what the management says. They say that they expect some of these uh, stage two loans can turn uh, NPA or uh, go to stage three. So retail disbursals were strong uh, up about close to 21% uh, sequentially. However, uh, due to wholesale book declining, the overall AUM has declined by 4.8% YOI and about 1.25% on a sequential basis. So the stock can be under pressure today. Okay, stock can be under pressure. Surbi is also joining in. She's tracking Star Health this morning. Surbi, how did it look? Decent set of numbers by Star Health, but it is a little weaker than what the street was expecting. Remember, year-on-year -year numbers are not quite comparable as Q2 of last year was affected by COVID. Gross return premium and net earned premium have both come in line with estimates at 3,200 crores and 2,800 crores respectively. Claims ratio is a little higher than the analyst estimate at 68% versus an estimate of 65%. Combined ratios are also marginally higher than the estimates at 98%. This has led to an underwriting loss of 13 crores versus an estimated profit of 39 crores. Profits have come in at 93 crores and solvency is higher at 1.95 versus 1.52 same time last year, which is a little comforting. Overall, the numbers are weaker than what the street was expecting. Noted that, uh, Surbhi. Thanks for that. Well, Sonal, coming back to you, Petronet LNG, how are those numbers? Uh, well, they look better than estimates. We are still awaiting the volume and capacity utilization at their different uh, facilities. But overall, the reported numbers look much better than what the street was working with. A revenue growth of 12% on a sequential basis. EBITDA was up 10% at 1172 crore rupees. Margins, which were expected to decline, have actually remained flat at 7.3%. And profits, they came in lower on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis, but they are much better than the estimates of 600 crore rupees. This time around, again, company recognized a one-time income towards use of pay charges of 415 crore rupees. Remember, last time they had recognized it in quarter four at 83 crore rupees and in quarter three at 333 crore rupees. So trying to understand the adjustments here, but on the whole, numbers look good this time. Okay, numbers look good. Let's go back to Ekta. She's tracking Narayana Health this morning. Ekta, over to you. Well, good performance coming in for Narayana because the revenue was up 21% year-on-year. -year. Margins improved to 21 versus 18%. And the profit jumped quite significantly. Remember, low base of last year. But nonetheless, Q1, Q as well, revenue was up 10%. Margins improved to 21 versus 19%. And the profit 170 crores versus 110 crores. So no complaints coming in for Narayana. We do have Apollo, which is releasing numbers today as well. So the hospital space will continue to be in focus in terms of earnings. Okay. All right, uh, Ekta, thanks very much uh, for that. Axis Bank uh, is uh, going to be in focus, and this is interesting. The government is selling a, a sort of chunky bit of what it holds in Axis Bank. Abhishek is here with more. Abhishek, hi. Hi, Prashant. So, uh, uh, government is selling 4.65 crore shares in Axis Bank that they hold via Suti. So, it's about 1.55% stake that uh, they have in the bank. The flow price is around 830.63 per share, which is a discount of 5% to yesterday's closing price. Remember that Axis Bank is trading around its uh, all-time high. The all-time high is around 905, 910. So, it's now about 875. It's a clean-out trade given the fact that this will be the last holding that they'll be selling. 
thing. Uh, just to alert our viewers, uh, on November 1st, uh, Bain Capital had sold about 1.24% stake in the company. They have about 3% left, but it has a lock-in of 90 days before they can further uh, you know, sell down in the bank. Uh, so share price, as I mentioned, is around all-time high. Back to you. Okay, all right. Uh, thanks for that, Abhishek. Well, Mangalam joins us to tell us about Nika. Mangalam? Well, our colleague Yash has picked up that, you know, there is a block deal likely in Nika today where City will sell shares worth nearly 250 odd crore rupees. And they're going to sell it at a discount to the current price, which in turn is already a 10% discount to its issue price and over 60% from its post-listing high as well. For Nika, there are a fair amount of moving parts as well because yesterday the lock-in for post-IPO shares, uh, rather pre-IPO shares opened. And today also the shares go X bonus. 5 is to 1. So you will see a steep uh, discount, optical discount in Nika's share price today. So those are a couple of factors that we'll be watching out for. Okay, 67% of Nika shareholdings will be released from lock-in. So very interesting day over there. Remember, uh, the stock hit a record low of 975 and is still down almost 50% year to date. It's had such a steep fall in the last one so year. I but think that 67% includes promoters as well. Yes. yes. Uh, so uh, from what I remember, there's about the, the lock-in uh, which perhaps is potentially can come to the market. I mean, all, not all of it will. Uh, I think it's about 10%, from what I remember. And I think Nigel no, put out a piece, a piece split, recently as well. It's actually split down the middle. Yeah. Uh, there's a large quantum that can get unlocked. Mm. And half of that is promoters, nearly half. I mean, 49 oh. or 51% kind of thing. So it's half half. So the uh, the hope from, uh, you know, the is that the promoters, obviously, they're not going to sell. That's the hope. Mm. So the effective quantum that will come in is the other half. That could, what that about could those, you know, early investors, H&I, &I, yeah, they all exit there? I, I, went, I did some work on that, actually. And I think uh, some of those pre-IPO uh, you know, pre investors, they have got shares as well at around 200 rupees. Mm. You know, which, so you're talking about the stock coming down, you know, 60, 70% from the top. That's in the listed market. For some of them, they're still sitting on five bagels. Yeah, so you know, so I, that's why the temptation to... Uh, my, my, I, I put this piece out in August. Uh, okay. So a lot of time has passed, and but at that point the feedback was that if there is one company where people are going to hold on and mm. there's not going to be too much sub be. supply which is coming, this is it's Nika. Nice. Yes. But from August to ni uh, now, I mean the yeah. price has come off a lot. Right. Uh, so you know it'll, that also of course has influence on how people uh, take a call. Uh, it's very yeah. interesting. A lot of these companies are now talking about paths to profitability, right? Yeah. I mean, they're starting to report good numbers. Nika, of course, is better than the rest of the lot yeah. in that sense. But uh, we heard Policy see. Bazaar, for example, yeah. yes. right? saying that in, by Q4 they will be uh, they will make uh, adjusted uh, adjusted base. Just one point, Sony, I want to make uh, is that uh, as we sort of roll into the end of the earnings season, it does look like there is more disappointment, right? Yeah. More down earnings downgrades as compared to upgrades. At the end of the day, stocks are slaves to earnings. I mean, yes. you react to earnings surprises or earnings misses. Yeah. Uh, for the nifty, I had looked at the numbers. For the broader mid-cap universe, have, I have not. But uh, there is almost a 5% downgrade mm. for nifty 50 earnings oh. from the first time these earnings came through. I mean, you know, earnings for any year typically start two years back, right? Mm. Uh, so there's about a 5% downgrade already, which basically takes us to around that 10, 11% kind of earnings growth. So this is no longer a 16, 17% earnings growth, which we started with for FI23. And this will influence FI24 numbers as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and what happens is if earnings are lower, mm -hmm. the P multiple is uh, is pushed higher, yeah. right, okay. uh, automatically. So uh, you you want you don't want too much of this, but I think that's what we're seeing as we uh, come to oh, the that close. That would be a worry, actually, Prashant, you know, because yeah. uh, uh, the the way the sheet was located, was FI23 will get that 15, 16% growth. Yeah. The problem yeah. is FI24, but yeah. if you're, you're going by what you're saying, uh, we'll have to keep actually, an eye on Actually, we're about, at about, I think, tracking 11, 12, and the worry is it may f actually fall to about 8, 9%, oh, which is, you know, uh, not all that great. Mm. FI22, we saw that big 40% earnings growth, but yeah. that was on the back of the FI21 COVID year. Low base. But straight down to 8, 9%, not good It'll news. Be okay, maybe it would be, would be a good idea to get, uh, you know, one of these uh, experts on board to tell us how they have looked at the earnings season so far. But generally, the horror shows come towards the end of earnings season, so that's what perhaps we're getting right now. Let's do one thing. Let's take a quick uh, recap of all the stocks that we're looking at this morning. Stocks with positive news flow. There's Lupin, Petronet, LNG and Narayana Health. Stocks with negative news flow, there's Tata Motors, Pidilite, Piramal Enterprises, Deepak Nitrite, Star Health, Axis Bank and Nika. But the real action is what's happening in the world of commodities. Not so much commodities, more like the cryptocurrencies which have seen a carnage over the last many days. Manisha Gupta joins in for a quick roundup there. Manisha, before you know it, it's been a slam dunk in the crypto market yet again. 
Oh, well, absolutely. You know, the month of October was good, but the month of November has started on such a disastrous note. And uh, the two top uh, crypto exchanges in the world, the way the statements have been on on Twitter in the last 24 to 48 hours clearly has led to a complete sell-off that we've seen in cryptocurrency markets. So even as we speak, it is down anywhere between 10 to 20 percent. It's the third straight day of sell-off in coming in for crypto markets. The global market up till now has declined below $900 million as well. So it has been a big sell-off billions of dollars of worth of uh, crypto uh, it, it, trade transactions is what we are seeing, but mostly coming in towards the sell side. Sell is what you are also seeing in case of the crude oil prices for a fourth straight day now, from $98 of a high to $92 is what we are seeing in case of the Brent prices right now. There has been an increase in margin in, uh, in trading Brent by nearly 5%. That has led to some people moving out. The Chinese demand is still on the weaker side. The U.S. inventories and production have increased yet again. And that's weighing for the fourth straight day in case of Brent crude prices also. Okay. All right. Uh, absolutely. That's a, a big one to track. I mean, uh, oil's come off as well, as Manisha pointed out. Manisha, thank you very much uh, for that. Now, back to cryptos and some opinion uh, here. This is Mohammed Al Arian's views on, the, on how the stress in the crypto universe could play out uh, going forward. And are there any spillover effects, which is what we're interested in? Listen in. The good news is, unlike banks, they're not part of the payments and settlement system. So we don't have to worry about big systemic effects. The bad news is what we know so far is stunning. The amount of irresponsible leveraging that has been taken, the cross-ownership of assets. I mean, this sort of thing should not happen. And it raises two issues. One, will contagion go beyond crypto? And two, what will the regulators do? I don't think contagion will meaningfully go beyond crypto. But I do think the regulators are going to be playing massive catch-up because what they're seeing, I suspect, will keep them up at night. All right, time to slip into a short break, but we'll discuss stocks on the other side. Rajesh Party of Investment Trust of India Long Short Equity Fund will be joining in with some fundamental stock analysis. Later on, we'll also connect with Mr. Yu Shekar of Galaxy Surfactants. Remember, they reported their numbers late last evening. Welcome back. Rajesh Bhatia is Managing Director and Chief Investment Officer at Investment Trust of India, Long Shot Fund. Uh, Rajesh, good, good morning. Great to have you with us here. Uh, on balance, uh, how are things looking, Rajesh, now? Uh, because the market, uh, the bank nifty is almost back at highs and uh, the nifty is uh, sort of tantalizingly close, 2-2.5% two, two away. Uh, but from here out, how are things looking? You know, I think uh, it's very conspicuous that the India story is catching the imagination of many people, uh, not least uh, the uh, global players as well. Uh, I think that you're seeing a lot of uh, research or uh, narratives around India being a, a place uh, to be in for the next three, five years, given the structural challenges that all of the developed markets are really seeing. Uh, so that narrative has really caught the imagination of uh, a lot of investors. Uh, and also the fact that given the, the rough sentiment that was there prevailing in the global markets and which has now seen some kind of bounce back, that has certainly helped our markets as well, uh, you know, to kind of bounce back. So on the positive side, that is really what you're seeing. Some of the FIs have come back, et cetera. On the negative side, I think, you know, I just heard you, uh, Prashant, talking about how earnings have been really weak. And I think you're really right on the button there. I think the earnings season hasn't really transpired in any healthy manner. Uh, I think uh, as you move forward, given the weak rural, given the still pressures from a global slowdown, uh, uh, and given rising interest rate environment, it's very difficult to see how you can have significant earnings upgrade, uh, you know, as you move forward. And as we speak, we are at the, you know, top tier of valuations at a time when cost of capital has gone up dramatically and very fast. Uh, that leaves uh, very little room for error as far as valuations are concerned and as far as markets are concerned. I think as a fund manager, as you move forward, our objective now is really to focus on stocks uh, and, you know, make it a more stock-specific approach, you know, as you move forward. That's really where we are. 
Okay, stock specific approach. So that's our cue, right? Uh, uh, tell us a little bit about how you approach these global facing companies like Tata Motors, for example, where there are still a lot of challenges. Uh, JLR's recovery is not panning out as well as one would have expected. Uh, what do you do with names like this? So, I mean, I mean, I don't have a specific view on uh, a com that company, but I can just tell you that we are a little more apprehensive of uh, global exposures uh, uh, at this moment. And I, I would be a little more cautious as to how the prognosis for the future. Look, you know, when you have such a significant change in the market complex globally, uh, in such a significant outsized increase in the cost of capital, I think you're bound to have accidents which you cannot see, foresee, uh, liquidity issues somewhere. I think you're seeing some of that in the crypto market. But given that com uh, uh, complex, I would say that we are a little more cautious on the global facing companies as you move forward. Okay. All right. Uh, Rajesh, request you to just hang on. We have a first corporate that's joining. We'll come back to chat with you. Galaxy Surfactants, well, they reported a good set of numbers. Revenue jumped up by 40%. The margins as well expanded on a year-on-year -year basis. The company, however, saw quite a bit of a contraction in the profits and margins on a sequential basis. Mr. Yu Shaker, the founder, promoter, and managing director at the company, joins us. Uh, good morning, Mr. Shaker, and congratulations on a pretty good showing. Uh, good morning. I, I had two questions for you. One is on your EBITDA per ton. Now, every time you join us, you talk about 16 to around 18,000 odd. You did close to 22,000. Now, given that you've, you know, done pretty well in the first half of the year on the EBITDA per ton front, do you want to revise that guidance, point number one? The second factor is on volumes. At the halfway mark, you're a little negative, but you were talking about 6 to 8% growth on volumes. Do you want to revise that number downwards? Go ahead. Yeah, uh, good question. Uh, as far as volumes is concerned, you have said that we would always like to grow ahead of the market and which we have done. We have grown ahead of the market as far as uh, India is concerned and the rest of the world. Uh, whereas we have not done that with respect to the Amet region. The drop in volume has been primarily driven by the drop in volumes in the Amet region. As far as India is concerned, we have grown in the quarter by 8% and 5.5% uh, for the entire uh, first half. Similarly, we have grown the uh, rest of the world. Of course, this is vis uh, vis -a -vis, uh, the same period uh, last year. As far as the rest of the world is concerned, we have again grown by about 2.4%. Whereas in Ahmed, we have declined by almost 19%, uh, largely caused by uh, local challenges as far as uh, the is concerned, which includes... You know, Mr. Shekhar, uh, so just request you to hold on. Uh, you know, we're just uh, having a bit of an audio glitch. We'll just... Uh, you know, try to sort that out. Just to tell our viewers, the numbers look good. The margins expanded on a year-on-year -year basis. On a sequential basis, there was some pressure. They've given out a presentation. As the management said, the Amit region, that's the one that is struggling for them. And volumes, that's why, a little bit lower at the halfway mark. That's the, but uh, Africa, Africa, Middle East, Middle East Turkey. Turkey. Yes. Uh, that is the Amit region. Amit that region, yeah. About. So yeah. that's that's the one that is struggling. It's down, I think, 19% at the halfway mark. But Mr. Shekhar is back with us. Sir, you were giving us, we have got your presentation late last night. You have uploaded it on the BSEM. And we've got most of what you're saying. We're asking you from year on, how does things shape up? One is on the yeah. volumes. Do you want to revise the volume estimate downwards? And do you yeah. want to revise the EBITDA estimate upwards? Yeah, Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we would be uh, very happy to uh, be equal to the volumes of last year. However, we are optimistic that we would grow by maybe about 2 to 3% as far as the whole year is concerned with service last year. That is what we would like to do. Of course, the caveat is with respect to uh, the challenges in, in the developed markets due to the recession where consumption has been in stress. Okay, and we are again uh, uh, cautiously optimistic as far as India is concerned, mm. though we have grown in India by almost 5.5% uh, for the entire uh, first uh, half, uh, we have to grow uh, in a similar or more as far as India is concerned for the rest half mm. to be able to maintain this particular aim. As far as EBITDA is concerned, as I said, EBITDA has been a function of, of uh, the first half uh, in terms of product mix one, Number two is uh, the, the volumes, uh, particularly the performance uh, uh, surfactants in the mass and mass teach segment has had uh, uh, an impact. And uh, third, of course, the currency depreciation, uh, the rupee from almost uh, 76, 77 mm -hmm. 
to today, AD 83. Uh, all these have contributed to the EBITDA uh, number. And as far as the entire year is concerned, we would expect for this particular year, sure. maybe to land at EBITDA per ton at 21 to 22 for the entire year. But uh, over uh, uh, the next few years, we would say the EBITDA would be determined by, again, the growth in volumes. Okay, so the, in important, in the important thing is as performance of factors grow further, the EBITDA may be cor you know, correct itself uh, to whatever we had indicated as a guidance in the previous quarters. So, Mr. Shekhar, just on volumes, uh, clarification, this AMET region, right, Africa, Middle East, Turkey, it's seen a steep fall. I mean, it's over 19%. Do you think in the second half of the year, how is the situation on the ground? Do you think this double-digit fall is something that can continue, uh, particularly for this region? Or are you seeing the worst already? Yeah. Uh, we, with the last week, we went through a similar cycle, if you remember, in 2019, when the Egyptian uh, currency was depreciated by almost, uh, you know, 100%, hmm. uh, from something like 8 to per dollar to almost 15 per dollar. As far as this year is concerned, the depreciation happened from 15 to 19 uh, in a, over a gradual, you know, four or five months. However, there has been a sharp depreciation from 19.5 to almost 23, 24 in a matter of 15 days. Okay. Mm. Now, this something similar we had seen about three years. So we believe that, you know, the, the decline has bottomed out and we are uh, uh, hopeful and optimistic that from here on, it, you know, the Egyptian market will grow. But however, the consumption has been severely, you know, impacted by one, this currency depreciation in mm. high level of inflation, as well as down trading. Mr. Mm. Shekhar, uh, hi, good morning. Uh, just a couple of clarifications. Uh, I heard you say volume growth of 2 to 3% mm. uh, for 23. Is that correct? That is what we would like would to like aim to. for as okay. far as this 22, 23 is concerned. As you know, uh, we are already uh, down yeah. by almost... Uh, Four uh, percent, as far as the first half is concerned. Uh, the, the last, the last yeah. number I had I written down. Uh, the last and I did uh, tell you a caveat yeah. with respect to the the, the consumption because uh, the concern is the recession and the inflation, right? Uh, both in India as well as the rest. No, of got it. Uh, mm -hmm. The last number I have written down is uh, some uh, around six to eight percent volume growth for. You're right. Absolutely right. So you're cutting that your volume good. growth for uh, for what you see from six to eight to two to three. For yeah, we would be happy. As I said, yeah. we would be very happy to retain yeah. the last year's volume. Okay, at the, that's at the, what is called the realistic level. That's clear. At the optimistic level, two to three percent. And uh, realize uh, and uh, a bit a bit uh, is twenty one. You see, twenty one to twenty two hmm. uh, a, a kilo. Yeah, yeah, the entire year is concerned. Okay, uh, for the entire year, five uh, twenty three. And uh, the and broadly, what I can understand what you're saying is that there was pressure already in this uh, Africa, Middle East, Turkey region. And now developed markets are also seeing uh, a fair bit of stress. So that is yeah. basically what is causing all of this uh, for you. Right, right, right. right. Okay. okay, all right. Uh, can you tell us what does all of this mean for your cash flows and your working capital cycle? Because uh, is there any high cost inventory at the moment? If this is the kind of pressure that you're facing already and you're scaling down your volume guidance, will it put more pressure on the working capital cycle as well as the cash flows? Very interesting question. See, uh, what is happening, of course, is that the, the huge commodity uh, rise in prices that we saw in, in the first quarter of this year is now coming down. We have seen uh, the Laurel Gold prices correcting significantly, one. Number two, the, the freight rates again have, have come down sharply, though they have not gone to the pre-COVID you know, levels. So, uh, you know, in, in the previous uh, uh, periods, we did... Uh, plan for extra inventory given the uncertainty with respect to the supply chain uh, 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 supply chain and logistics. But now with more predictability, we are able to plan better. And uh, the inventory uh, in terms of number of days will start uh, improving and correcting themselves. So uh, as far as cash flow is concerned, uh, no, uh, you know, we have not had any, you know, major uh, aspects of it, given that, you know, we have performed well. This was a particular, the entire, uh, you know, first half, as you would see, was a pretty stable half as far as we, you know, we are concerned. And uh, uh, so the inventory will correct itself. I mean, in terms of the number of days. Yeah. All right. Uh, Mr. Shekhar, we'll leave it there. And uh, hopefully things will incrementally get better and uh, the next time we speak.
Uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Perspective. Thank you. Uh, and and so some of this is again is the global uh, effect, right? Yeah. I mean, this the slowdown is, that we're seeing in global markets. I mean, you can look at Tata Motors, for yeah. example. You can mm. look at Bajaj. I mean, because they're they're operating in Africa as well, yes. and we've heard yes. that repeatedly. The currency move and stress uh, demand-wise for some of these uh, global regions, but it's so different for different areas. I mean, you know, you look at truck sales out of the U.S., North America, Class A truck sales, which we track. Mm. Those are doing uh, just fine. Yeah. Right? Uh, so. Very, very tough with uh, global businesses, and that's exactly the point Rajesh was uh, making. Uh, he's waiting by. Rajesh, uh, so I don't know if you want to make a comment, uh, go ahead, but one uh, company which has been, which you've liked, you've owned Bharti, uh, without being stock specific, that is one of the companies, few companies, which is actually seeing earnings estimates gradually getting revised higher. Any thoughts? Go on. No, I think uh, it is probably thanks to the nature of the business and the structure of uh, the industry that has shaped up. Uh, uh, the nature of business is that it's less cyclical uh, and uh, uh, the uh, structure of the uh, industry is now that it's becoming a more like a two, two and a half player kind of market. Uh, and where Bharti has clearly caught the premium end of the market. Uh, and uh, I, I think it definitely is perceived as a premium player uh, in, in that market and therefore it has probably some of the best uh, uh, customers and therefore the highest ARPU in the uh, in the in industry. So it's less cyclical, the structure is better, and there's a gradual ramp up of realizations which were at really record lows. So, you know, it's very easy to drop prices. The pri drop in prices was very sharp in terms of realizations for telecom companies, but you can see that to take it up, mm -hmm. that's a gradual process. So my sense is that, you know, as you move forward, you will have increases in ARPUs, uh, given that India is still among the lowest uh, tariff uh, uh, countries in the world. And uh, therefore, as you move forward, that narrative will get better and better. Mm. Okay, all right, Rajesh, uh, stay with us. For the time being, we'll slip into a short break. We'll continue our chat with Rajesh. We'll also get in Mitesh as well as Sudarshan. They'll be joining in to tell us, how do you approach trade today? Welcome back to Bazaar Morning Call. So the SGX Nifty is now down almost 71 odd points. It was a brutal sell-off that we saw in the Dow, down over 650 points. The cryptos have seen a huge carnage and that rub-off impact is what you're seeing in our own markets as well. But we've been uh, standing tall. So is this a time to buy the dips? Is this the time to step aside? So Darshan Sukhani, uh, the technical analyst and Mitesh Thakkar, a proprietor at EarningWaves.com joins in. Gentlemen, morning to both of you. Uh, Sudarshan, let me start with you. What do you do at a time like this? Do you buy the dip or do you wait a bit? Because there is some important data coming out later in the evening from the US. Well, I think today we wait a bit. Uh, that, that data is coming. Ma markets can change. They just, you know, some election results can go favorable. Markets may ignore the election results finally. So many things can happen. But the fact remains, that yesterday was a weak day, and just before that on Monday, the markets made a low, bounced back. But they are, earlier the lows were being bought into for the last two days, that has not happened. So it's much better to wait patiently and let's see, let the market decide its next course of action. I would assume that we'll still be in an uptrend, and this is probably a consolidation. But let's find out that message from the market. So for me, today is ideally a patient, you know, step aside day and for the nifty as well as for the bank nifty okay all right step aside is what sudarshan says and uh, maybe the match as well in the second half uh, will uh, you know take most of the eyeballs but bitesh what do you say we like to start off with a gap down would you be looking at buying into the nifty or do you as well want to want to step aside uh, Nigel, I think uh, yesterday in the last hour, no, what was happening for the couple of days ago was that we will have some kind of recovery towards the end of the session. Now, that didn't happen uh, yesterday. And we saw mild weakness coming in the uh, indicator charts on the hourly and the two hourly basis. So my sense is that this correction could be slightly more uh, deeper. Uh, it could give a stronger pullback than what you see in the last few days. And therefore, immediately buying after a 50-point gap down may not be a good idea. I think the key supports which, uh, <clears throat> which I would watch 
on the downside will be closer to about 18,000 and then 17,850. So around 18,000, we'll see if there's some kind of semblance of a reversal happening. Then I think a long can be done. Hmm. Okay, what about individual stocks? What are we looking at this morning? Uh, Sudarshan, let me start with you. Well, we are still looking to buy uh, wherever it is appropriate. You know, the trend has not changed. So for individual stocks, uh, there are buying opportunities. Uh, Cummins is a buy. Cummins had a very decent rally in the last few weeks, and that should continue. Buy with a stop loss under 1300. Uh, Dr. Lal Patlab is an intraday short. Yesterday, it had a very big down day, and it's been a slight underperformer. That's an intraday, only my only short candidate with a stop above 2450. Hero Motor Corp, I heard you talk about it in a different context, is a buying opportunity. The stock has been trading in a range, and that range appears to have some bullish overtones. So that's a buy with a stop under 2575. And finally, UBL is another buying opportunity. It's in a trading range. That range is on the verge of breaking on the upside. So UB United Breweries is a buy with a stop under 1640. Mm. Mitesh, uh, what about you? What are your trading ideas? Yeah. So, uh, I would look at a mix of buy and sell calls today. Uh, on the buying side is uh, uh, AU Bank on a mild decline around 635, 636. Buy here with a stop at 624 for targets of 665. And Bosch had a good breakout. That's a buy with a stop below 16900 for targets of 18000 on the sell side is Godrej Properties. Keep a stop at 1190. Look for targets at 1130. And Jubilant Foods had a breakdown. That's a sell with a stop at 577 for a target of 540. Okay, by the way, folks, I don't, I don't want to, you know, state it out loud, but everyone knows that in, in, in Adelaide, apparently, there is a huge cloud cover. So, there oh. could be a, it could be rains, it could be a washout. I'm not stating it. <laughs> I'm just saying so, that, you know, uh, what temper, is, temper your excitement a little bit. What, <laughs> what happens in that case? <coughs> but, so, 130 uh, becomes 3. It's only a starting <laughs> point. <laughs> okay, so we can track it after all, right? After a full day of watching the markets. Uh, okay, let's do one thing. Let's uh, take a quick commercial break. On the other side, we'll come back with the pre-opening rates. We'll also have Venkat Jasti of Suvin Pharma to discuss their Q2 numbers. Stay tuned.